Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in Hernando County, Florida, and I'm here today with my regular co-host, Lily Browning. Good morning, Lily. How are you doing? I'm great, Bill. How are you? A little cold this morning, but yeah, not too bad. A little bit, but it's January, so that's all right. Yeah, as long as I don't get up and see that it's 27 degrees anymore, I think I'll be good. And remember, I told you we have three-day winters in intervals. <laughs> three yes, days of winter, do. somewhere around two weeks off of winter, then three days of winter again, <laughs> you know, a couple of weeks off. So, and But was, the sun shines almost every day, so that's a major thing. That's why we're out here in Florida. Exactly. It looked beautiful outside this morning, but boy, that cold weather really froze the heck out of my bananas. I'm going to have to wait and see how they end up surviving or dealing with all of it. Mm -hmm. So we got Brenda on here who's able to join while she works. That's so. cool. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a coincidence? <laughs> Shh, just don't tell her boss. Yeah. Uh, morning, Carol. Um, a couple other regulars here. Yes. Um, that reminds me, uh, since Brenda's watching while she's working, I need to um, remember to watch the program you had the other evening, which I didn't watch in the evening. So I'm going to put that on while I'm, while I'm working. Why don't you tell them about that? Because it's, I think, very interesting. Yes, that went very well. Um, Tuesday evening, we had a class. We're going to try to once a month have something we call dinner in a class. So we're going to have, you know, a class here on um, StreamYard uh, broadcast through Facebook Live and through YouTube Live in the evening for people that work. And that way they can watch it live and they can ask their questions. And whoever you're going to provide do. dinner. No, 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 no. We're not no. making any arrangements for dinner. No, oh, well, well, come on. Wait until afterwards to get my dinner so <laughs> that's <laughs> a good thing that you're not teaching talking and eating at the same time. <laughs> yeah i'm not to the point where i'm like eating dinner while i'm moderating it although we may i might try that sometime that's, that's a good idea but so what was the a, subject we had a great class with one of our brand new master gardeners sydney and she talked about food forests and I think we ended up with a, a peak number of 102 people viewing. We had a lot of questions, a lot of interaction, which was really great. And if anybody's interested in watching that, that is saved on our Facebook page and our Facebook group and also our YouTube page. So the video is on all three of those locations if you like to watch it. And a nice thing about doing things on Facebook Live or YouTube is it all gets saved. So if you're not able to join us live, you can watch it later that night or the next day or the next week or whenever it might be. So um, somebody here is watching from their garden. Facebook yes, user. Facebook user is a regular. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't even know what temperature it is outside. What is it? 58. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. It'll be beautiful, but it's it's still a little bit chilly at the moment. <laughs> if you're working in the garden, that's perfect. Sitting there might be a little chilly. <laughs> um, okay. We have somebody at the nursery watching this morning. So that's oh. great. Uh oh. Facebook user gave theirself away as a master <laughs> gardener. Now we can really narrow them down. <laughs> exactly. So if anybody has any lawn and garden questions, just go ahead and ask them. And I wanted to point out that people will ask questions and they'll ask, you know, will this plant grow well in my yard or this one or what do I do? Since people watch us from all over the state of Florida and probably even outside of Florida sometimes, it really helps if you also mention your question where you live. Yeah. Because a plant that grows great in Miami is not going to grow well in Jacksonville, especially during the winter. Mm -hmm. So we do have a question here from Carol Ann. 
Once a bird of paradise flowers dry out, do I remove them or just leave them alone? Are there seeds in there that I can cultivate? I had a bird of paradise plant before, a white bird of paradise, and it was over in Volusia County, and it wouldn't flower a lot because it would always get a little bit frozen back or freeze damaged every winter. Mm -hmm. So it would kind of recover during the summer, maybe get to the point where it flowered, and then you get another freeze the next year. I'm not aware of any seeds that are in those flowers. So after it flowers and the flowers dry out, you can trim them off. But I would be careful not to do so in the winter um, because they are frost sensitive, not just freeze sensitive, they're frost sensitive. So again, you know, if it's been bit by the cold, that kind of dead looking material will protect the rest of the plant. Yeah, as a general rule with everything this time of year, you pretty much want to leave it alone. I know Although that's I, I have a story. Um, <laughs> what I was going to not leave alone <laughs> was the Spanish needle that, um, you know, put itself in my flower bed and my love-hate relationship with this weed. It, I mean, it's a weed. It is a weed, mm -hmm. and, but it's a native plant. And every time I wanted to say you don't belong in my front flower bed i went out there and i mean just dozens of pollinators all over the place so i didn't have the heart i kind of cut it back a little bit but i didn't have the heart to get rid of it so now you know it looks brown and dead now and there's no killing that <laughs> it's going to come back so i you know went about removing it luckily not with my lawnmower because i've done that before but I was just kind of chopping and pulling. Well, as I moved to another area to do it, when I started with my pruners, bunny hops out, runs away because, you know, I disturbed her. And so then I said, I can't, I can't. She was not only using this for shelter. I'm quite sure there was a nest that she had in there. And the bunnies in my yard love to put their nests right up against my house. And that's where... This was, I guess, safer, maybe a little bit warmer. I'm not sure. So even though I was going to try and trim away this very aggressive native plant, knowing I couldn't kill it, in that area I had to stop because it's still fulfilling a function for nature. Not attracting any pollinators right now, but it was fulfilling a safe place for that bunny to put her nest. So, you know... When you want to have a Florida friendly yard, you you got to let uh, nature be more important than looks <laughs> in your yard, I guess. Exactly. And a lot of those plants, I know Spanish needle, every little flower sets seeds. Mm -hmm. And those seeds are an important food source for birds over the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, the leaf litter and debris underneath them is an important hiding place for insects many of which are beneficial insects to overwinter. So it's, you know, what you may look at as like ugly brown weeds out in the yard that must be cleaned up today to make my yard look nice are really performing a lot of functions year round, you know, yes. in the summer when they flower, in the winter when they're brown and they look like they're not really doing anything important. Yep. So this went beyond even pollinators and insects and butterflies. This was, you know, mammals. Mm -hmm. that needed that shelter too. And boy, those plants drop a lot of seeds. You will probably have a bumper crop of little ones coming up in the spring. Oh, I know I will. And now that the, you know, the bunnies are there to eat the seeds too, they'll <laughs> spread them around for me. <laughs> so Brenda had a good comment here about the bird of paradise. Um, She's never seen seeds either, and she just cleans them up in the spring. And that's what I would do also, because by spring, you have a number of dead leaves. If it flowered over the winter, you have the dead flowers. I really try with many plants to just clean them up once in March, get them all cleaned out, trimmed back to where I want them or shorter, and then let them go for the rest of the year. That's what I was going to say. I was going to have you define spring. March, Florida, March, March ish, anywhere between March 1st and March 31st. And I, I'm not a weatherman. I can't predict the weather. I don't write old farmers almanac, 
we may not get any cold weather after late February, or we may get a really bad late freeze at the very end of March, beginning of April. You never know. So it's always a gamble. Right. So split, wanna, the di split the difference and stay St. Patrick's Day. And <laughs> you know, you'll yeah, be yeah, yeah. pretty safe. Or if you want to be extra careful and you live, you know, Hernando County or north of here, wait until April 1st. Right. It doesn't hurt to wait a little bit longer and then go out there and remove all the dead leaves, dead branches, dead flowers, clean things up, clean them out a little bit. A lot of plants will get too dense in the center and you want to remove any dead branches that are in the center and kind of open them up. Get a little sunshine in there, a little extra airflow. That's really going to help with disease control and insect control. Then after that, let them go. That's what now, I do. Now they'll I try in our little bush. intervals between our winters. You'll get new growth naturally, mm -hmm. and that's why we say, well, if there's going to be then another cold snap, that new growth is really susceptible to it. So having the ugly stuff around that helps protect it. Although I have seen something going on. Speaking of the weather, the weather is so unpredictable that the azaleas don't know what they're doing. Have you seen them blooming? Azaleas are easily confused. You will see a couple flowers on them pretty much any time during the year. I've seen a couple flowers on in the middle of summer. So they're yeah. easily Well, confused. yeah. I mean, there are different, like, fall blooming and all this Um but I'm talking about the old fashioned, what were they, Karoom azaleas, you know, those, yeah, yeah. those really bright pink ones um, or dark pink ones. I, you know, I was driving around, I guess, over the weekend and in the normal places where you see them blooming, I mean, they're just going to town blooming. I'm like, whoa, 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 you're like a month early. What are you doing? <laughs> and it's confused by the weather, I guess. Mm -hmm. That can be a problem when we get a lot of cold weather early. And by early, I mean like November and December, because mm -hmm. when it warms up for a week or so, the plants are thinking, okay, it's we spring. Have the cold weather, and now yeah, we have winter. it must be spring, so it's time yeah. to flower. So I, I'm sure that they're having some issues with some of the different um, fruit crops, like peaches, plums, nectarines, blueberries, blackberries, things like that. They might begin blooming a little bit, a little bit too early. Same with azaleas, same mm -hmm. with a lot of plants. Mm -hmm. They'll get confused for a little bit. Hopefully, we won't have any really bad late frosts and freezes because that could be very yeah, damaging. We, just, we don't know. Black yeah, now, we don't I'm know gonna, what the weather is going to do. Exactly. I'm going to let you pronounce the name of this plant here <laughs> that her mom <laughs> asking about. <laughs> Let's just forget the wiser there and go with Lang Lang. <laughs> Let's try that one. I can handle that. Okay. What's the success rate of a Lang Lang plant? And I am not really familiar with that one. Maybe if Teresa is tuning in or um, I see BJ is on here with us live today also. So if anybody wants to Google that one, or maybe you're familiar with it, you have one in your yard, you're the Lang Lang plant expert because honestly, I'm not. Nope. I haven't heard of that one. Um, maybe it's a tropical or maybe it's one of the new, oh, your chickens love Spanish needles. Interesting. Yeah, Steve, Brenda came up with another reason to keep the Spanish needles around. Chicken mm -hmm. like them too. And I know birds will eat seeds off of all those different things that you may consider weeds in your mm -hmm. yard, weeds in the brush. Yeah, yeah. And okay, Cindy Pinellas. here from Pinellas County. And Brenda, here, I'll let you handle this one because you are the crepe myrtle expert. When does she prune her crepe myrtles in the winter or early spring? And she, she does not want I do to prune, prune my crepe myrtle. myrtles in the winter slash early spring, but I do not do a crepe murder. That is fantastic. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> if you go to my Facebook page, Hernando FFL Program, I pinned to the top um, a demonstration that I did. What was that like two, three years ago, Bill? You filmed me yeah. Yeah. pruning my crepe myrtle. What happens um, is 
And this is the time of year. And Bill and I are going to redo a program. We had some difficulties with yesterday's program, therefore it couldn't be recorded. So we're going to redo it just for recording purposes tomorrow. And I'm going to discuss pruning in there and, and pruning crepe myrtles. Well, and, and as I said in the program, if you're all real quiet, just listen. Can you hear the chainsaws out there? <laughs> They're out there right now going after all those gray myrtles. And what happens is people severely prune them. And why? Why do they severely prune them? Because they see other people severely pruning them. And they think that is the proper thing to do. And and it doesn't kill the crepe myrtle right away, so they don't think they're causing any damages. But what happens is you you, you limit the life of the tree when you do that. Um, I was talking to Frank Galdo, who is the FFL agent in um, Pasco County, and he said he was thinking about crepe myrtles. And um, if people thought of them like... And the way we think of bonsais, I'm not saying the bonsai or crepe myrtle at all, but the way we think of them is we love them for their form, right? And for, you know, even when they, if they don't have leaves or whatever, we would never think of chopping them to death. We would enjoy the form of that bonsai. And if we kind of got that mindset in our head that a crepe myrtle has an, if you leave it alone, is beautiful uh, winter form. It doesn't need to be covered in leaves and flowers to be beautiful. It has beautiful bark that as it gets older, it gets really smooth and can get in interesting shapes. But what we do is because we think we have to, we what we call hat rack it, severely prune it down. That takes away a lot of the um, energy and the sugars and the carbohydrates and everything, you know, that is needed in that tree. If you keep doing that, you'll see the stumps like this. We've all seen that, right? And it just, you know, I say it's angry. It's like, why did you do that? Um, and the growth that you get is always basil cell, brand new, whippy-like growth every year that falls during storms. You get bigger flowers, but you get less. If you just leave the tree in its natural form, you can prune it because it's susceptible to powdery mildew, things like that. So what I do is I, I go in inside the tree and anything that is about pencil sized or so, you know, get rid of that. All that twiggy new growth. If you have crossing branches, choose the better one and leave that one there and, you know, take the other one away from it. Go to the bottom and crepe myrtles uh, always have suckers. Get those suckers out, clean the weeds and stuff out there. If you want to chop off those old um, flowers, the black flowers, we call them calyxes, you can, but they are. Birds do eat those too. It's all you need to do for your crepe myrtle, and it'll live a long, happy life. If you tell me, but it gets too big, then that's back to wrong plant, wrong place. <laughs> So, exactly. That's my great Myrtle um, lecture for the day. <laughs> well, hopefully that helped out Lynette, who says she has two crepe Myrtles and she's a winter resident, so she's never seen them bloom before. What do I do for maintenance? I did so, a class. Flower yeah. in the summer. So if you're not here in the summer, you're probably not going to see them flower a whole lot. I did a class on... Um, uh, winter resident, you know, what to do, how to have a Florida friendly yard if you're a winter resident here. And actually I did not recommend them having crepe myrtles because what's the point? I mean, they are, they are, they do have nice winter interest, but if you can't see them full of flowers, it's kind of like you're not enjoying the full aspect of it. So, I mean, she can prune it like I just told her to, knowing that she'll keep a healthier tree, but her neighbors are going to get to enjoy all the flowers. Yeah. <laughs> you can call and ask your neighbor what it looks like or send you <laughs> pictures, I guess. Yes. <laughs> okay, going back to that other plant, BJ said, okay, is Elaine. Elaine. Thank you, Elaine. BJ. Okay, see, I learned something today. <laughs> and and what, what, uh, yeah, what do we know about them? 
it is tropical. And Brenda Googled it and said the Elang Elang is best in zone 10B and frost free areas of zone 10A, which means that's pretty darn tropical. That's yeah. Miami homestead area. Right. Um, and the person who first asked, she said she was Tampa. Yeah. So you are going to be pushing it. And you can do that. I mean, people, um, I know somebody in Citrus County that has Carambola, which is star fruit, which is very tropical and a number of other tropical fruit trees, but you have to plan on keeping it warm. Otherwise, when, you know, the temperature gets down in the twenties, it will freeze and possibly die all the way to the ground. You have to make arrangements to keep it warm, which means growing it in a pot and dragging it in your garage having a greenhouse that you can put it in to keep it warm on those cold nights, you're going to have to give it some serious cold protection. And some of those tropical plants, it doesn't have to get to 32 to damage it. They'll get unhappy when the temperature gets much below 50. Yeah. And the colder it gets, the unhappier they get and they'll start, they'll stop growing and they'll start showing some damage, maybe even in the forties. So you really want to do some reading and studying if you're going to try growing tropical things that are way out of your plant hardiness zone. And I mean, by all means, experiment and try it and give it a shot. People in Hernando County successfully grow bananas and they're tropical and they mine. Pump. You can look outside right now. Mine froze <laughs> when it got really cold because I didn't take steps to protect them. I'm a big believer in they need to get by on their own without me being out there with sheets in the cold. Cause I don't me like to. I stopped the sheet thing quite some time ago. It's a tough love situation out there. Exactly. They're going to have to survive all on their own without a whole I have some house plants, plants on the porch that I brought closer to the house. And I have this, um, I have some cardboard because, you know, we all do because Amazon comes to our house every day. So I kind of built a cardboard <laughs> fort around them. You know, their uh, heritage Swedish ivy like we all have. That was my mother's. And that's, you know, the only real kind of protection I tried to do. So. And we have a totally different kind of question here from Carol Ann. Do we fertilize all year down here, Florida versus Western New York, which are obviously two opposite ends of the world. So different planting wise. So fertilizing here is different as a general rule during the winter most plants are going to go at least somewhat dormant and you're not going to fertilize them so that applies to your lawn and this depends on exactly where you live the further south you are the warmer it stays during the winter and the less dormant anything goes i know that people with saint augustine lawns in miami they grow year round they never turn tan and they you know keep having to cut them and maintain them year round. Whereas here in central Florida, it's different. They do go dormant, but the only things here in central Florida that you really would want to fertilize during the winter is if you have a vegetable garden, you can fertilize your vegetables that you're growing during the winter lightly, you know, lightly and frequently, not a ton of fertilizer all at once. If you have a flower bed where you're growing pansies, petunias, things like that, you could fertilize lightly. Other than that, there's really nothing else that needs to be fertilized during the winter because of the plants not actively growing. It's not taking up that fertilizer. So you're wasting the fertilizer, wasting your time and money. And the fertilizer you do put out there is going to go somewhere, not into the plant. So, Lily, where do you think that fertilizer is going to go to? I believe it's going to go into our aquifer through our exactly. sandy, beachy soil. Yes. It's and we are under the blackout phase of exactly. our of our lawn um, fertilizer ordinance. January first through March thirty first, Hernando County residents are not allowed to fertilize their lawns. Um, there are other. Uh, I was thinking I'm going to do a short recording explaining that, so that might be showing up on my Facebook soon. Um, and so that's the. The take home thought of it right now, if you see companies doing it, um, 
if you see them doing it right now, they're not a great company to have, right, Bill? But, yeah, because your lawn does not need it. You're right, not right. in a situation where your lawn needs to be fertilized right now. If they have a license to apply fertilizer, um, they are allowed to apply slow release. You know, 50% or more of the product has to be slow release nitrogen. They're allowed to do that. And the reason the ordinance was written that way is because we know they have a lot of places to cover. So instead of saying you have to wait till April 1st, like everyone else, we were kind of giving them a little bit of leeway, like maybe they can start in mid-March. If they're starting in January, <laughs> get another <laughs> lawn company. <laughs> they're not, your lawn has no ability to take up that fertilizer at this point. Exactly. And very important, those rules apply just to Hernando County. So right. fertilizer ordinance rules differ from county to county. Polk so County may be, uh, may very well. A lot of those southern counties, um, your blackout phase is June through August because of the heavy summer rains. Mm -hmm. Our ordinance is being evaluated, isn't it, Dr. Lester? Yeah. So changes might be occurring but you know it's government so don't think it's going to happen tomorrow <laughs> but when those changes occur don't look for the changes to be less strict <laughs> it's going to be a little bit more strict we may add on those summer months um because exactly. of the rains yeah so this is one of those situations that's constantly changing so keep tuning in to keep on top of what's happening in Hernando County. But if you're from another county, go ahead and check with your extension office or possibly follow their website or follow them on Facebook to keep on top of, you know, your county's fertilizer ordinance or fertilizing rules, because you don't want to be out there either watering your yard or fertilizing incorrectly and have your local code enforcement officer drive by and have a discussion with you. And um, BJ's County, Citrus County, they have the same months as we do, um, January 1st through March 31st. Their blackout period is longer than ours. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. They're through no, April. No. So They're through April. April. They can't start until May. She's probably typing that, correcting me right now. <laughs> <laughs> she probably is. You'll follow up in just a second here. <laughs> so with the... With Hamala and the Elang Elang plants, mm -hmm. I think I got that correct. She also has banana and tamarind and mangoes and sapodilla, and that's great. Those are most of those are very tropical fruit trees. And you have a better a chance in Tampa than we do here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of fun to experiment with, but just know you're experimenting. Yeah, you're experimenting. Yeah, and to make your Purchasing power with the knowledge that <laughs> with the knowledge that um, you're experimenting. There's BJ. <laughs> I knew she would be correcting us. Yes. Yes. November in Citrus in County, your blackout period for homeowners fertilizing their lawns is November 1st through April 1st. So Ooh. that's an example of this. These rules vary from county to county. They do. To county. Yes. Okay. And I know we were, we have a 10 foot rule that if you live on the water, you can't fertilize within 10 feet of that waterway. I know citruses is, is 25 feet. So. Yeah. So along with the blackout period, there's a lot of different rules that you need to be aware of to do it correctly. So I know that I got, and I, uh, hopefully Carol is still watching us this morning. Carol emailed me a picture of a problem that she's having with the tree and I wasn't even really familiar with the tree. So let me go ahead and screen share here and I can show you the picture that she sent me and we can cover that. Okay, here we go. Carol emailed me a picture and this is great. If any of you before Thursday have pictures or a problem plant, Feel free to email them to me, and that way I can pull the pictures up here 
live on Thursday morning and everybody can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. But Carol has a Geiger tree in her yard. She lives in Pinellas County in zone 9B and the tree has a north exposure and pretty much full sun and it has white stuff on the leaves. Just on the lower part of the tree, she said, basically just from the ground level up to the up to about three feet high and it's hard for me to tell from the picture exactly how tall the entire tree is but i looked at this and what that looks like to me is powdery mildew on the leaves which is unusual because you don't normally see that on a tree but i looked it up and lily also had to look it up because neither one of us is particularly expert at white geiger trees <laughs> They're not Florida natives, correct? Oh, let me look. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> they are not. Florida friendly book. No. <laughs> so they're not native to Florida, um, but they're not particularly invasive that I know of. They may be a problem far south in South Florida, but not that I know of in Central Florida. It is a very hardy tree and makes for a very good um, street side tree they are salt tolerant apparently so if you live near the coast that's an important consideration to think about when you're putting in a tree uh they handle brackish water and wet soils very well but yeah for some reason this tree seems to have powdery mildew right and what but they're is, also a 10b um to 11 zone so again we're back down to miami right Yes, so, this is another example of something that does well in South Florida. So even Pinellas County, which is warmer than here, to grow Geiger trees, you're pushing it. You're kind of at the very edge of Geiger tree world, basically. But, you know, what? When, when you mentioned now that you said that was on the mm -hmm. bottom part of the tree up through three feet, it made me wonder if it's an irrigation issue, like that's where it's being splashed by some type of irrigation. That could be because powdery mildew is a fungus that makes that is on usually the upper side of the leaf and it gets the kind of white powdery, almost stained look on the leaf. Mm -hmm. And it's spread very quickly through moving water. So if you have an irrigation system and you're watering the tree and it keeps black, the sprinklers keep blasting the bottom part of the tree it's just going to spread the fungal spores from leaf to leaf and make it spread more. And that may be why it's only affecting the bottom part of the tree. This fungus is a little unusual because it prefers cooler weather. Mm -hmm. It can be a problem sometimes in summer, but not, you don't see it an awful lot really in the heat of summer. It's one of those ones that tolerates it cooler. Um, if the tree is a manageable size, and like I said, I can't see exactly how tall it is, <clears throat> you could spray a fungicide on the tree, which is going to protect the new growth and the unaffected leaves. But as a general rule for a tree, we wouldn't recommend spraying with the fungicide because most trees are large and it's very, very difficult for you to safely spray a tree with fungicide without getting it on yourself we don't want to see you on a ladder with a backpack sprayer or anything like that. You're just going to fall and get hurt. So we don't recommend that. You may just want to let it go until spring and try to prune it out as best you can in spring because there's a chance that when the weather changes in spring, this disease is going to back off or go away. Mm -hmm. But you probably do want to check the irrigation and make sure that your sprinklers aren't blasting the bottom part of the tree. If it's, if it's, you know, a couple years old, if it's a couple years old, turn the irrigation system off from that tree, cap it off. Because in my Florida friendly book here, it has a, uh, a dry drop, which means that they like it uh, drier. And, you know, so, oh, no irrigation on it. Well, it could be rain well, splash no on. <laughs> could and even be rain splash on. Approaching splash nine off. feet tall. Okay. So, <clears throat> it may be safest to just let it go and try to prune it out in the spring mm -hmm. because if it is powdery mildew, some of those leaves that are very heavily covered with it are probably going to eventually turn brown and die and fall off. 
If any of the leaves do turn brown and die and fall off, you want to gather the leaves up or rake them up and throw them away in the trash because those leaves are going to be covered with fungal spores that are just going to spread back to the tree and get on more leaves. So sanitation helps a lot also. Okay, and it's about right. three years old. So it should, yeah, it should need, it should survive on natural rainfall at this point. Yeah, this isn't a really common problem with this tree either because I looked it up and it said there's really no major uh, insect or disease problems. It's a very, it tends to be a very hardy tree. And BJ pointed out, correct, the lower branches are probably not getting really good aeration or airflow. Um, but as soon as spring comes around and it gets a little bit warmer and the leaves stay dry, you know, during the day and overnight, it'll probably drop off or back off or go away. Mm -hmm. What you probably want to do is either now or you can wait until spring, prune a few of those branches out at the lower part of the tree to just kind of increase the airflow and the amount of sunshine that you're getting into the tree. Both of those really help with uh, controlling diseases because if your tree gets really dense and overgrown, and really thick in the center. In the middle, it's gonna be, it's always gonna be dark with no air movement, very humid, very wet. And that's just absolutely perfect for diseases. We see that a lot with people's hedges and things like that. Sometimes you just gotta go through and thin them out, take the dead stuff out. It's a lot of work, but for the plant's health, that's the best way to manage it. So yeah, like I said, if you guys ever want to send a picture in before Thursday, more than happy to open up Dr. Bill's email and share it with everybody. And see, that's two things I've learned about today. I learned about white Geiger trees too, so. Yes, and Elang Elang. Elang Elang, yes. I'm gonna have to look into that and, and maybe I'll get one from my yard. I'll wait till spring though, I think. Mm-hmm, <laughs> yeah. I would wait till spring for just about anything. I think my yard is pretty, pretty brown out there. Mm -hmm. The only thing not really brown in my native area is the um, climbing aster. So <laughs> it's a great winter plant to have. Yeah, that does flower during the winter. That's kind of mm -hmm. an unusual time of year flowering plant. And that's great to have for pollinators. Um, I oh, yeah. I have a um, queen palm tree out front that I noticed just the other day is flowering. And I always leave the flower clusters on the palm trees until they're done flowering for the bees and pollinators. Mm -hmm. Because if you have palm trees to flower, you may have never noticed it before. But when you see a flower, just go out there and stand underneath it and look up. And you'll see those flower clusters just absolutely cover with honeybees and wasps and native pollinators. And there's not a whole lot else out there flowering right now. So good way to help those guys out. And Carol said, good point on the density. She does have muley grass that kind of encroaches on the tree. So huh. it may be an airflow issue at the bottom part of the tree that's causing it. So if anybody has any other questions here, we are more than happy to either answer them or have our other viewers answer them for you. <laughs> this is very helpful, yes. Exactly, yeah, I like mm -hmm. that. I know it's always great when Teresa is on here because mm -hmm. I'll talk about something and all of a sudden the comment pops up with a University of Florida fact sheet link or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, go ahead and share that if you do need to contact our office, feel free to give us a call. If you call the office number, you will almost definitely get in touch with Teresa and she will do her best to answer your questions or forward it to a master gardener to answer or forward it to me and I'll get back with you with an answer. I, I saw that your master gardeners are now open until noon instead of 11 for a while. Yes, yeah, the master gardener nursery during the summer, they close a little bit earlier 
because it does get really hot outside in the summer. Mm-hmm. But this time of year, they're open from 8.30 in the morning until noon on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Cool. And if you need to email me directly, please feel free to do so. That That's definitely the best way to get in touch with me. And if you have a Florida-friendly landscape question, you need to get a hold of Lily. There is her email, mm-hmm. lilyb at hernandocounty.us. That's a long email address. It is. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Two L's in the middle. Remember that or you'll, you won't get me. <laughs> Or it will get kicked back, yes. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. If you're in Hernando County and interested in um, the upcoming rain barrel and compost bin workshop, um, that's going to be in the evening on January 21st will be the Zoom meeting, and then you'll pick it up from the Master Gardener Nursery the following Saturday. I get a lot of people, you know, from different counties, and you are, (laughs) well, you're welcome to just listen in. So, you know, you can just email me and ask about that. You're welcome actually to purchase a rain barrel from me if you want to come all the way up here (laughs) to pick it up. Um, The compost bins, because they are no cost, are for Hernando County residents only. Um, But I would also encourage you to check with your county's county extension office to see if your specific county is offering something a little bit closer to you that just be more convenient for you. But you're welcome on, I like to say you're welcome to sit in and listen. We'll allow that. (laughs) Is that on, that's on Facebook events, right? Yeah. Well, it basically says to contact me and I'll send Mm -hmm. you the rest of the information because that's definitely a sign up type situation. Mm -hmm. So if you need any more information on that, or if you want to check out any of the other classes that we have scheduled coming up, if you just go to the website that is scrolling along the bottom of your screen there, www.hernandoextension, all one word, .com, you're going to see a full listing of all of our upcoming classes, all of my classes, Lily's classes, information on the rain barrel class, the compost bin class, all the links and contact information for that so that you can go ahead and put that on your schedule and tune in because we do things on zoom. We do them on Facebook live. We do them. It's, it's difficult for me to keep on top of sometimes. Oh yeah. We're, we're always, we're doing stuff. We have been busy in the pandemic. <laughs> yes. And something I mentioned the other night when we had uh, Sydney doing her class on food forests, if you guys have any suggestions on what you would like to see us do a class on, please feel free to share them with us because I start to run out of ideas sometimes. Mm-hmm. I mean, gosh, we could do a class on everything from septic systems to rain barrels to composting to vegetable gardening. I guess now we could do a class on Elang Elang. <laughs> To learn a little bit more about them. That might be a pretty interesting topic. Yeah. I know. And yeah, it's it's kept us um, on our toes because we don't want to repeat too much stuff because it's all being recorded. Mm-hmm. And those of us in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Department, we have nine principles. <laughs> you know? So try so to make you know pull new stuff out of nine principles each time has it's been a fun challenge i think so yeah yeah it really helps if you guys send your ideas and suggestions to to help us out a little bit and cindy mentioned that she saw something about sunken gardens which is in saint pete and i saw that this morning on the news also they were broadcasting live from sunken gardens and i've never been there before but our master gardeners a year or so ago, pre-COVID, went there on a field trip, and they had a great time. They actually have one of the um, people who worked there gave them a tour of the place, and it's the Florida Botanical Gardens in Largo. Or the, no, that's a different. No, no, those are two so, different things. Yeah. But yeah, those are both great. Yes. I think the botanical gardens are near the extension office down there. I think 
so Pinellas County Extension is, they do have a um, botanical garden on their property or right next door to them at least. Mm -hmm. And do they still have the Florida house there? I'm not sure. I don't make it down to St. Pete very often. <laughs> yeah, in Largo they had, um, it was a, like a demonstration house um, about how to live eco-friendly and they had gardens all around it. Class on garden pests and diseases, Dr. Lester. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite topic. I believe oh, your yeah your doctorate is in what plant pathology <laughs> <laughs> with a minor in entomology. A different spin on it. Oh, but BJ says yeah. the Florida house is gone. That's sad. No. <laughs> yeah, Florida house is gone. We are going to have a class coming up um, in February. Did I make that the last? Last Wednesday in February, in which I asked you to assist me. February 24th at 10 o'clock. Bugs that bite, sting, or taste you. That is specifically for, you know, human interaction. But we can also, um, we should, you should come up, you should come up with a class on, uh, maybe in the spring, on um, common diseases. And is this, is, is this a disease? Is it a pest? How do I take care of it? Kind of thing. I did that for common diseases in landscape plants. I think it's time to do that again. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you, Lee. We'll go ahead and put something together on that because right now, since we're in the middle of winter, other than white Geiger trees that don't get enough air circulation. There's not a whole lot of issues with plant diseases right now. Yeah, but maybe and, as a March class, that yeah, would be beginning of March. That's insect pest yeah. pressure is a lot less right now also. They're still out there. I mean, if you're growing cabbage, you'll still get caterpillars on it, and you'll still get fungal leaf spot, but it's not nearly as bad now as it is during the summer or especially late summer. And so, speaking, yeah, I'll plan, yeah. I'll plan it for spring. Good idea. And speaking of, you know, insects like that, that'll bite you. Um, we, we have classes and we invite mosquito control and she keeps reminding us um, just because it's cool right now, the mosquito eggs don't freeze. They wait. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to kill them is getting them out of the water and onto the ground. But if they're in any water whatsoever, they'll just wait till it warms up and they'll hatch out then. So be diligent still dumping water out around your yard. Exactly. And Cindy looks at life the same way I do, that insects are a great topic. <laughs> Bill has a collection of bugs. <laughs> yeah, and I'll have to get creative and figure out because when I do those kind of classes in person, we always have a lot of show and tell and things to pass around and look at. And we can set up the microscopes to look at the really tiny insects. I'll have to figure out how to show insects like on the camera here. And, you know, I bet that we can do that. So we'll have to work on that one. So does anybody have any final questions here? Let me go ahead and mm -hmm. show our contact information one last time here. If you want to give us a call, if you want to call Teresa and ask her a really, really difficult question, <laughs> pass it on to me. So, <laughs> And you might send it to me. <laughs> so. Sure. Sometimes we like to pass questions around to each other. <laughs> and if we don't know, then we'll send it to BJ. Exactly. And we start sending it to other agents. And yes. that's the nice thing with extension because um, if I have a wildlife question, I'll send it to Maxine Hunter, who's the agent up in Marion County. She's been on here before as a guest. And she, I learned a lot from when she was on here as a guest about how to deal with wildlife, moles and gophers and things like that. 
If I have a tree question, we have certified arborist, Jamie Lynn, who's over in Lake County. I sent her pictures. As a matter of fact, I'll probably share that Geiger tree picture with her later, just to, mm -hmm. just to share. So we share questions and we share unusual things that we've seen or been asked about with each other. So we're kind of one great big team. Yeah, and that's, it's great that way because everyone, um, you know, you have all these different brains to pick. Everyone has their different specialties. Plus we work with the kind of people who love to learn. <laughs> You know, we've never heard of Elang Elang. We well, we want to learn more about it. <laughs> so that's that. That's a great atmosphere to work in. Yeah. So I'm definitely not an expert on certain things. Don't ask me snake questions or bird questions or lizard questions. I know a little bit, but not a whole lot. I know a little bit more about insects. Birds are my. Um, I think they're going to end up being my retirement um, project. I want to learn more about, I want to learn, you know, as much about birds as I know about plants, but that might have to wait until I'm not working. So, I think that's called lifelong learning, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Brenda says she's got to go because she has a meeting at work. So Brenda, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you later. And I think we're going to go also, but we will be back again next week. I do not have a definite guest for next week, but I'm going to work on that. So, BJ. Um, BJ. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have BJ back on again. So, But BJ, thank you so much for tuning in and helping out with some of those questions there. Every little bit helps. Mm-hmm. Okay, but everyone, thank you once again for tuning in, and please be sure to tune in again next Thursday. Just follow us on Facebook, and you'll be able to find the link and where we're going to be at. And until then, Lily, I guess we will see you next week. Yep. Okay, bye, guys. All right, thank you. Have a great day.